This is Focus on God's Word with Graham Weir. Hello, I'm Graham Weir, and I want to welcome you to part two of the Reformation Revisited. This is the six part dynamic series dealing with the impact of the Protestant Reformation and its vital implications for the survival of Christianity today. And in this presentation, we're going to take a deeper look at some of the teachings of Martin Luther and the various denominations that arose after Martin Luther. And we're also going to take a look at how to tell the difference between a true and a false revival. So let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you once again for the opportunity to contemplate the great Protestant Reformation and the mighty heritage that you have given us through that. The journey from darkness into light and the amount of light that arose piece by piece with the reformers that rose after Luther, that we might gain an appreciation for the emergence of Christianity and what it has cost in these days. So please bless us and once again give us ears to hear and eyes to see and heart inclined to do your will because we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our text today is Proverbs 4 verse 18 and it says this, the path of the just is as the shining light which shineth more and more unto the perfect day. This tells us that the Christian journey is a journey from darkness into light. Have you ever walked out of a dark room into blazing sunlight? It really hurts, doesn't it? And we have to shield our eyes until until they've had time to adjust to that brightness. But for the same reason, Christians emerging from long years of spiritual darkness were unable to receive the full light that we have today until they had time to adjust to it. And this process took many years. Well, after Luther's refusal to recant at Worms, he was on his journey home to Wittenberg when he was unexpectedly ambushed by a band of men who separated him from his companions and galloped off into the night. Well, he disappeared for many months, and most people thought that Luther had been killed. But what really happened was that some of his wealthy supporters, who didn't really trust the king's pledge to keep him safe, arranged to have him taken captive to Wartberg Castle, near the village of Eisenach in Germany. You can go there today and you can see where Luther was. Here he was to be kept safe in isolation where he could think and plan future directions without anyone knowing really where he was. And when you think about that, sometimes when God allows what appears to be a setback, he's really preparing for a great comeback. And this seeming setback for Martin Luther was undoubtedly part of God's great plan for the Protestant Reformation. Because in this room, Luther translated the entire New Testament into the common language of the German people. In here, he had plenty of time to think and to study and to write. Now, I'm going to show you a list of some of the many long-forgotten Bible principles that he brought back into the light. The first one was holy clergy. No more dishonesty or evil living. He taught holy finances. Money to be used properly, not to be used to sustain evil lifestyles of corrupt priests. He also taught that we should keep the commandments to honour God, not as a means of salvation, but to honour God. He also taught that great principle of the Protestant Reformation, solo scripture, the Bible and the Bible only as the foundation for faith. He also taught the importance of studying Bible prophecy in order to be prepared for the future. In order to understand the future, he knew we had to look to the past. He also taught that the Bible has more authority than the traditions of men. And he taught that great principle of justification by faith, the belief that we are saved by God's grace alone, not by any of our own good works. 
He also taught that we need to confess directly to God, not man. It's not necessary to, to confess to a human priest because he believed the priest has no authority or ability to forgive sins. But like the man emerging from a dark room into a blinding light, Luther was unable to see clearly all the points of truth that God wanted to reveal to the world. In fact, he even believed that some of the books of the Bible really shouldn't be in it. He wanted to tear out the books of Esther, Hebrews, James, Jude, and, Re and the, the uh, Revelation. He wanted to throw them out. He felt they didn't have any part with the Bible. But God knew the darkness that Luther and the people of his time were emerging from. In fact, the most prolific woman writer in American history, Ellen G. White, summed up the situation very well in an article she titled Martin Luther, His Character and Early Life. This was published in 1883, and take a look at what she said. She said, Foremost among those who were called for God to break the chains of popery and lead the church into the light of a purer faith stood Martin Luther. Though like others in his time, he did not see every point of faith as clearly as we see it today, yet he earnestly desired to know the will of God and he joyfully received the truth as it was made plain to his understanding. Well, besides Luther, other reformers arose and the Protestant Reformation spread throughout Europe and England. But after it became established in several countries, something strange began to happen. The English reformers, while they renounced the doctrines of Romanism, had still retained many of its forms. So although they rejected the authority in the creeds of Rome, a lot of Roman Catholic customs and ceremonies were copied into the worship practices of the Church of England. And the inclusion of these Catholic customs tended to narrow the gulf which separated Reformed churches from Rome. Their leaders justified these compromises by saying that it would make the Protestant faith more attractive to Roman Catholics. But the church members, well, the church members who were lukewarm and willing to compromise, these reasons seemed valid. But there was another class who weren't so easily deceived. The fact that these customs tended to bridge over the chasm between Rome and the Reformation was to their minds a conclusive argument against retaining them. Well, as the Church of England continued to compromise the principles of Protestantism, then, like the Roman Church before them, they gained the aid of the state and they started to enforce their doctrines by civil law. Thus, persecution and public punishment of dissenters again emerged, making the Protestant faith no better than the Roman Church that it came out of. Well, to preserve their freedom of conscience, many were forced to flee to Holland, a republic that allowed people to worship God as they chose without fear of persecution. And from there, God pointed some of them across the sea to a land where they might found for themselves a state and leave to their children a precious heritage of religious liberty. Well, to get an insight into what was happening to the Christian faith at the time, we can get a clue from this painting in the rotunda of the United States Capitol Building in Washington, D.C., I lived there for a couple of years and I saw this painting on the wall. In this painting, we see Pastor John Robinson praying for the pilgrims on their ship, the Speedwell, on the day of their departure from Delft Haven in Holland for the New World on July 22, 1620. And what he said to the pilgrims gives us a clear picture of the condition of Christianity at that time. Let's take a look. Note carefully what he had to say to them. He said, For my part, I cannot sufficiently bewail the conditions of the Reformed churches, who are come to a period in religion and will go at present no further than the instruments of their Reformation. The Lutherans cannot be drawn to go beyond what Luther saw. And the Calvinists, you see, they stick fast where they were left by that great man of God, who yet saw not all things. This is a misery much to be lamented. 
For though they were burning and shining lights in their time, yet they penetrated not into the whole counsel of God. But were they now living, would be as willing to embrace further light as that which they first received. He said, remember your church covenant in which you've agreed to walk in all the ways of the Lord, made or to be made known to you. Remember your promise and covenant with God and with one another to receive whatever light and truth shall be made known to you from his written word. But with all this, he says, take heed, I beseech you, I warn you, I plead with you, what you receive for truth and compare it and weigh it with other scriptures of truth before you accept it. For he said it is not possible that the Christian world should come so lately out of that thick darkness and that full perfection of knowledge should break forth at once. So we can see from this history that the problem with Christianity at that time was the fact that each group would not advance any faster or further than their leaders went in their understanding of truth. And this is an error that we must avoid today when every wind of doctrine blows. It is absolutely essential for our growth as Christians, and it doesn't matter what denomination you belong to, to study and examine for ourselves what professor teaches the truth say to us and not just be satisfied with accepting anything without question. What do you say? That should be the basis of the Protestant Reformation. And this quote from Ellen White makes this very clear. She said this, We must not think, well, we have all the truth, we understand the main pillars of our faith, and we may rest on this knowledge. The truth is an advancing truth, and we must walk in the increasing light. And if you look back at some of the main denominations that arose from Luther's time to our time, we see the increasing light of truth emerging. Let's take a close look at some of the key doctrines that emerged during the climb out of the Dark Ages. The Lutherans restored the truth of Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible only as the foundation for faith, and salvation by faith alone, not works. The Anglicans restored the truth of no idols or images, and the worship of Christ, not Mary. These are all essential points that we had to hear to merge out of darkness. And the Presbyterians restored the truth about practical Christianity, simple lifestyles, and no formalism or displays in the churches. And the good old Baptists restored the truth about baptism by immersion, not sprinkling. And that great principle of freedom and democracy, the strict separation of church and state. We owe our freedom today, our freedom to worship God in freedom of conscience to the good old Baptist. They started it, and we can be grateful for that. The Methodists restored the truths about the need for obedience to the Ten Commandments. And look at this, as a response to salvation, not the means of salvation. Very important point. This was the great principle that Martin Luther discovered when God spoke to him as he climbed those stairs on his knees. And they also restored the truth of the importance for standards of Christian behaviour. And the early Adventists, I'm not talking about Seventh-day Adventists here, they restored the truth about the second coming of Christ and the cleansing of the sanctuary. And remember, they were the people from many denominations who suffered what we call today the Great Disappointment. This happened during the late 19th century. I didn't understand until later that the scripture references to the cleansing of the sanctuary referred to the one in heaven, not the earth. In those days, many people thought that the earth was the sanctuary. And when the Bible said the sanctuary was to be cleansed, they thought it meant the cleansing of the earth by fire. It wasn't until later that they discovered their mistake. And finally, the Seventh-day Adventist arose out of that great disappointment and they restored the great truths about the Sabbath being the seventh day of the week and not the first day of the week. And they also restored the truth they identified at the time of the investigative judgment and God's three final warning messages to the world. Now something we need to notice as we look at this story is the fact that as the church fell away into the Dark Ages, 
it persuaded the state to enforce its doctrines by civil law. It was the result that millions of people suffered great persecution and death. Forcing some of them to risk a dangerous sea journey to find a new land where they could live without fear of persecution. And these refugees eventually wrote a constitution that ensured their new American states would never make religious laws. And I say eventually because it didn't happen quickly. Some of them even made great effort to make their Protestant faith the law of the land. And they too began to persecute those who didn't agree with them. In fact, religious freedom didn't really emerge in the statute books until the founder of the Rhode Island colony, Roger Williams, was the first person in modern Christendom to establish civil government on the doctrine of liberty of conscience. The public or the magistrates may decide, he said, what is due from man to man. But when they attempt to prescribe a man's duties to God, they're out of place. And there can be no safety because it is clear that if the magistrate had the power, he may decree one set of opinions or beliefs today and another tomorrow. And that has been done in England by different kings and queens and by different popes and councils in the Roman Church. This has all happened before. He said eventually these great principles of freedom were incorporated into the federal constitution of the United States with these words. Note carefully what they were. And every American will know what this is. It says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So today we can give thanks to God for this great principle of government. And that grew out of the Protestant Reformation. And I believe it's one of the biggest reasons for the freedoms of democracy enjoyed by so many countries today. What do you say? We can thank God for that. And Australia, among many other countries, sees the wisdom in such statements and enshrines this principle in its constitution. Let's take a look. It says religious freedom is safeguarded by section 116 of the Australian Constitution, which prohibits the federal government from making any law, establishing any religion, imposing any religious observance, or prohibiting the free exercise of any religion. Individuals are free to express a diversity of views so long as they do not incite religious hatred. And that clause was put in our Constitution largely because of the lobbying activities of two Seventh-day Adventists. It's an important point to remember. And it's also enshrined in the United Nations Charter, Declaration of Human Rights. It says everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. So friends, we can thank God for his hand on these early pioneers who built the foundation of democracy on the principles of the great Protestant Reformation. And today we have an unparalleled window of opportunity in democratic countries to worship God in freedom of conscience without fear of persecution. That's great news, isn't it? Yes. But the window is closing. In fact, we have come to a period of time in history when the end of all things is fast approaching and many of God's people are not ready. Ellen White stated it very clearly when she said this, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. So we ask the question, what is she talking about? What is this revival of godliness spoken about here? How can we identify it or even tell if we have it? 
Well, let's look more closely at the dramatic effects of the Word of God on people in the past. Wherever the Word of God has been faithfully preached, results have followed that demonstrated its divine origin. The Spirit of God accompanied the message of His servants, and the Word was with power. Sinners felt their consciences quickened, deep conviction, deep conviction took hold upon their minds and hearts. They were convinced of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. They had a sense of the righteousness of Jehovah and they felt the terror of appearing in their guilt and uncleanness before the searcher of hearts. In anguish they cried out, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? As the cross of Calvary, which with its infinite sacrifice for the sins of men was revealed, they realised that nothing but the merits of Christ will be sufficient to atone for their disobedience to his commandments. This alone, they felt, could reconcile men to God. And with faith and humility, they accepted the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Through the blood of Jesus, they had remission of sins that are past. And these souls brought forth fruit meet for repentance, as the Bible calls it. They experienced dramatic changes in their way of life, changes that demonstrated that they had been filled with sorrow for their past mistakes and had somehow received a vision of a bold new direction for their lives. They believed and they were baptised and they rose to walk in newness of life. They were new creatures in Christ Jesus. They no longer had any interest in following their former worldly attraction. But by the faith of the Son of God, they now wanted to follow in his steps to reflect his character and to purify themselves even as Christ is pure. The things they once hated, they now loved. The things they once loved, they now hated. The proud and self-assertive became meek and lowly of heart. The vain and supercilious became serious and unobtrusive. And the profligate became pure and the drunken became sober. The vain fashions of the world were laid aside Christians sought not the outward adorning or plaiting of the hair and a wearing of gold and putting on of jewellery and apparel, but the hidden man of the heart. In that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And that was in 1 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Genuine true revivals brought deep heart searching and humility. They were characterised by solemn, earnest appeal to the sinner and by yearning compassion for the purchase of the blood of Christ. Men and women prayed and wrestled for God, with God for the salvation of souls. And the fruit of such revivals was seen in souls who shrank not at soft denial and sacrifice, but they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer reproach for the sake of Christ. Men beheld a transformation in the lives of those who profess the name of Jesus. The community was benefited by their influence. They gathered with Christ and they sowed to the Spirit to reap life everlasting. And they made it very clear by their example that there is no evidence of genuine repentance unless it works reformation in the life. What do you say? No evidence of genuine repentance unless it works a reformation in the life. Now I'm going to read you something and the commentary notes that I'm reading to you were written in 1900. So we might need to ask ourselves the question, are these comments still relevant today? And please note also as I read through this material, which is a bit heavy in places, that I, it's not my purpose and it's not the purpose of this series to put down any specific denomination or individual. I'm simply reading the comments of historians about religious movements or systems in general. As you listen, you can decide for yourself if they remain relevant in this age. So let's continue, and I'm going to quote. But many of the revivals of modern times have presented a marked contrast to those exhibitions of divine grace which in earlier days followed the labours of God's servants. 
While it is true that large numbers of people are attracted to these events, and many of them profess to be converted and join the movements, nevertheless, these outward signs are insufficient evidence that there has been a corresponding increase of real spiritual life. Often the flame of revival, which flares up for a time, soon dies out, leaving the darkness more dense than before. So you can answer the question, is that still relevant today? What do you say? Do you think it's still relevant? And we continue quoting, popular revivals are too often carried by appeal to the imagination, by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling. Converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truths, little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service is something of a sensational character, it has no attractions for them. A message would appeal to unimpassioned reason awakens no response. The plain warnings of God's word relating directly to their eternal interest are unheeded. Unquote. Is that still relevant today? What do you say? Yes. yes. I continue. With every truly converted soul, the relation to God and to eternal things will be the great topic of life. But where in the popular churches of today is the spirit of consecration to God? The converts do not renounce their pride and love of the world. They are no more willing to deny self, to take up the cross and follow the meek and lowly Jesus than before their conversion. Religion has become the sport of infidels and sceptics because so many who bear its name are ignorant of its principles. Remember the author was speaking generally about certain types of religious movements. Do you think your statements are still true today? Yes. Yes. I'm continuing. The power of godliness has well nigh departed from many of the churches. Personal display, lands and goods, and worldly occupations engross the mind. And things of eternal interest receive hardly a passing notice. In those churches which Satan can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exult that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. There is an emotional excitement, a mingling of the true with the false, that is well adapted to mislead. Yet none need be deceived. In the light of God's word, it is not difficult to determine the nature of false movements and revivals. Wherever men neglect the testimony of the Bible, turning away from those plain soul-testing truths which require self-denial and disallowance of the world, there we may be sure that God's blessing is not given. Do you think that finding is still valid today? Amen. And by the rule which Christ himself has given, in Matthew 7, verse 16, he, shall, he says, You shall know them by their what? Yes. By their fruit, meaning the evidence of their behavior. In the light of that, this commentary says, It is evident that these movements are not the work of the Spirit of God. In the truth of God's word, God has given to men a revelation of himself. And to all who accept them, they are a shield against the deceptions of Satan. And it is a neglect of these truths that has opened the door to the evils which are now becoming so widespread in the religious world. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. I continue quoting. The nature and the importance of the law of God have been to a great extent lost sight of. A wrong conception of the character, the perpetuity, and the obligation of the divine law 
has led to errors in relation to conversion and sanctification and has resulted in lowering the standard of piety in the church. He is to be found the secret of the lack of the spirit and power of God in the revivals of our time. Does that make sense? Let's try and summarize this to make it more clear in today's language. The author is saying here that a misunderstanding of the divine law, and we're talking about the Ten Commandments, not the Old Testament laws about sacrifices and offerings. A misunderstanding of that divine law has led to a misunderstanding about the nature of Christian conversion and the process of sanctification. Let me repeat that. A misunderstanding of the divine law, the Ten Commandments, a misunderstanding of it, has led to another misunderstanding about the nature of Christian conversion in the process of sanctification. It's a very important point. Because if a teaching or a doctrine says that the law was done away with at the cross, then it will naturally result in a complete misunderstanding about the true nature of conversion simply because the Bible plainly says in Psalm 19 that the law of the Lord is perfect. What's it doing? Yes. Converting the soul. Without the law, men have no correct conception of the purity and holiness of God or of their own guilt and uncleanness. They have no true conviction of sin and they feel no need of repentance. Not seeing their lost condition as violators of God's law, they do not realize the need of the atoning blood of Christ. The hope of salvation is accepted without a radical change of heart or reformation of life. Now they confess to being converted, but without a correct understanding of God's law in the Ten Commandments, that type of conversion will be little more than an intellectual ascent. There will be little, if any, outward change of character or behaviour. What do you say? Do you notice that? I continue quoting. There is a spirit of self-exaltation and disregard for the law of God that mark it as foreign to the Bible. If the advocate teaches that sanctification is an instant work by which through faith alone they attain perfect holiness. Only believe, say they, and the blessing is yours. No further effort on the part of the receiver is supposed to be required. But at the same time, they deny the authority of the law of God, urging that they are released from obligation to keep the commandment. But is it possible to be holy without coming into harmony with the principles which express God's holy nature and will? What do you say? No. It's not possible. The testimony of the word of God is against this ensnaring doctrine of faith without works. It is not faith that claims the favour of heaven without complying with the condition upon which mercy is to be granted. It is presumption. And the Bible makes this very clear in the book of James chapter 2 verses 14 to 24. Let's read it. We'll open our Bibles and we'll read it. James 14, James 2, verses 14 to 24. And it says this, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Yeah, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Okay, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now believe us that there is one God, they do as well. The devils also believe and they tremble. The wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Mm -hmm. 
And there's more good news from the inspired visions of Ellen White, who said that God revealed to her that in spite of all the devil's deceptively engineered false doctrines and the widespread corruption of true faith and piety, there are still genuine followers of Christ in these deceived movements. And she said this, Before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic time. The spirit and the power of God will be poured out upon his children. And at that time, many will separate themselves from the churches, from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and his word. Many, both of ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has called to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. That's good news, isn't it? Yes. Amen. In visions of the night, she says, representations passed before me of a great reformatory movement among God's people. Many were praising God. The sick were healed and other miracles were wrought. Hundreds and thousands were seen visiting families and opening before them the word of God. Hearts were convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and a spirit of genuine conversion was manifest. On every side, doors were thrown open to the proclamation of the truth. The world seemed to be enlightened with the heavenly influence. Great blessings were received by the true and humble people of God. Aren't you looking forward to those days? Yes. Amen. Well, it's already happening. Right now, I want you to watch this video clip from the world headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist <coughs> Church. The General Conference is launching a new, visionary, bold initiative called Total Member Involvement. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is coming very soon. Every church member can do something. That's what Total Member Involvement is all about. And the Lord has placed on my heart a huge burden, a burden to help each of us realize that we must be totally involved in God's last day message. And that has to do with everything from speaking the word to living the word, following Christ's example in everything, helping people physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. Thousands and thousands of lay people are actively involved in praying for their neighbors and giving Bible studies and distributing literature. But whatever we have done up until this point, it is not yet total member involvement. One of the greatest challenges we face is the devil's attempt to neutralize our mission, endeavor, and focus because we don't have a relationship with the Lord. I'm reminded of what Ellen White said in Desire of Ages, page 142. In order to develop a character like Christ, we must work as he worked. There is something about service, something about ministry, something about witnessing that brings revival to our own hearts. This is why I am so encouraged about total member involvement. There are so many examples all over the world as to what God is doing through his members, through those who are really committed to him. There in Chitungwiza in Harare, Zimbabwe, thousands of people involved in specific assignments in reaching people with the precious message, whether they were visiting, whether they were helping out in a health expo, uh, whether they were doing Bible studies, whether they were just welcoming people, whatever it was, they were involved. In Zimbabwe itself, there were over 918 meetings going off at the same time all across that great country. And in the end, 30,000 people were baptized. A beautiful example in San Antonio, Texas. Literally thousands of people involved in reaching out to the community of San Antonio. Over 700 people were baptized. 
One of the things that really amazed me about San Antonio and that your best pathway to health was that total involvement, 1,500 people involved, ministering to the needs of over 6,100 individuals that came. Many of them stayed all night in line. And as I watched what God did, it was amazing. In Harare, Zimbabwe, over 30,000 people were affected through this special outreach, which God says is the right arm of the gospel. One can praise the Lord and say, wow, that's great, it happened over there, but what am I going to do in my little place? What about the difficult parts of the world? What about postmodern culture? I know this, some places are more difficult than others. But if you don't believe that you can win people for Christ in that setting, you won't win anybody. I want to tell you the Lord has a job for all of us and God is going to bless you regardless of how small the operation or how large. Doing something gives God an avenue to bless. The real factor is your commitment to the Lord and to following Christ's method alone. How can I as a church member become involved in total member involvement? The first thing that I think is significantly important is to get on your knees and begin to pray and say, Lord, I am consecrating myself to you. I'm giving myself to you. What do you want me to do? Whatever it is, whether it's to be an intercessor in prayer and concentrate on a prayer ministry, whether it is actively involved in health ministry, whether it's literature ministry, whether it's children's ministry, whether it's Bible study ministry or preaching. I just feel an overwhelming burden that all of us need to be involved. Everyone has a job that the Lord can provide. Everyone can be a missionary for Jesus, no matter whether you're in a sophisticated society or in a simple setting. God can use each of us. Jesus has given us a great commission to go and preach and teach and baptize. The commission is to you personally. It's to me, no matter who you are. Why not get on your knees and say, Jesus, I want to be an active witness for you. I want to be involved, totally, completely involved with the entire church in total member involvement. Good news? Yes. yes. Want to be involved? Yes. There's no greater activity this side of the kingdom of heaven. What do you say? Yes. It's a great thrill to help people come to a knowledge of the truth. And there are multitudes of sincere people who have been living in transgression of God's law without realizing that the forbearance and patience of God is about to end. And now he in mercy is calling them to obey its sacred precepts before it is too late. The message must be given that all who will put away their sins by repentance towards God and faith in Christ are offered pardon. Friend, Jesus is about to return. Do you believe it? Yes. Jesus is about to return. The signs are fulfilling fast. We need to be personally ready ourselves and ready to warn others before it is too late. And the good news is that Jesus promises to give us divine supernatural power to help us obtain all the things that are necessary to achieve godliness and eternal life. Listen carefully to these words in the second book of Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. Let's have a look at second Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. And it says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. How has he given us that? Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these great and precious promises ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, 
and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good news? Amen. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Isn't that good news? Yes. Amen. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? Yes. Amen. Our only hope of overcoming sin and evil is to learn of Christ. We must know what he is to those he has ransomed. We must realise that through belief in him, it is our privilege to be partakers of the divine nature. Good news? Yes. I need more than human nature. I need divine nature, don't I? If I'm going to overcome sin. And so escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. And then we are cleansed from all sin, all defects of character. We need not retain even one tendency to sin because of that supernatural power that God promises us. If you feel a great desire to accept God's offer of salvation and become a partaker of his divine nature and you would like to learn more about the many wonderful truths and promises found in his word, I would like to invite you to pick up your pen and write down this vital information. And here is the details you need. Inspired by the Reformation, the Great Controversy DVD production is a musical and historical journey through Europe. It is written's John Bradshaw joins Fountain View Academy to host this production filmed in five different countries of Europe at historically meaningful sites. These young musicians share not only music, but personal testimonies and powerful Reformation stories still relevant to our lives today. To order your own set of the Great Controversy DVD and book by Fountain View Academy Orchestra and Singers, visit their online web store at store.fountainview.ca. That's store.fountainview.ca. Or you may call them in North America on 1877-490-4141. And there's more good news. As we partake of the divine nature, hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong will be removed from our characters. And we will be made a living power for good. Do you want that? I tell you what I do. We will cooperate with God in overcoming Satan's temptations. That's fantastic news. We're not left to struggle with error and deception alone. God works and meat works, that men may be one with Christ, just as Christ was one with the Father. Remember he prayed that prayer? Then we begin to experience what is meant by the statement in Ephesians 2 verse 6 that says, God has raised us up, meaning out of mental darkness and the dark ages of thinking and darkness of error and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The mind rest with peace and assurance in Jesus. A far better kind of peace than the world offers. Listen, Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Is that good news? Yes. Amen. Friends, I believe as we study and digest God's living word in the Bible, he will transform us by the renewing of our mind. Do you want your mind renewed? He promises it in Romans 12 verse 2. And he will enable us to complete the task that he's prepared for us to do. Are you ready? Are you ready? Amen. 
Are you willing tonight to unite with Christ to proclaim God's last warning message to the world? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Amen. I hope you will make a decision to ask Jesus to take over your life and show you what he wants you to do. As you listen to this beautiful hymn sung in the church of that great martyr, Jerome, Bethlehem Chapel in Prague, by the choir and orchestra of Fountain View Academy from Canada, my faith has found a resting place. My faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he Did you enjoy that? Yes. Beautiful music, isn't it? Thank you very much. Let us thank God as we close in prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you so much for the mighty heritage you've given us of Christianity. That you've helped us today to appreciate that which has happened before, the slow and painful climb out of darkness into light. And Lord, as we look at your word, and consider the spirit of prophecy and the writings that you've given us. We look forward to the future with great hope and gladness in our hearts, confident in the knowledge that you have promised us 
supernatural help to overcome sin. So Lord, we pray for this supernatural help today and ask your blessings upon us to empower us to move forward in faith and practice that we might honour your glorious name because we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. been listening to Focus on God's Word with Graham Weir, a production of 3ABN Australia Television. If you have any comments or questions, send an email to radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au.